a purpose, obviously, behind that. There's something that those ads are trying to do. And even though they might annoy you, the goal is that they are trying to persuade you. They're trying to influence you in your opinion and your behavior. And I tell you what, it's, it is still, I mean, at 42 years old, I still am at times just completely, I don't know the word. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's one of those fancy words, like perplexed or something. But I mean, I, I'm like bewildered and befuddled and confused and sometimes overwhelmed when it comes to politics and I think I want to have an informed opinion. But sometimes it's just really hard to be informed. It's like, who do you trust? Where do you go? And you hear, you know, you almost hear these candidates saying the exact opposite things. And, and so when you hear outlandish things or you hear these, these attack ads and so forth, and you've got to decide, you know, how, how do you decide what's true? How do you decide uh, what you're going to believe? And for me, anyway, I think one way you do that is you, um, you try to understand their track record. You try to understand their character. You try to find more about what they've done in the past and have they, uh, how they live their day-to-day -day lives. And, and so, in essence, you're trying to figure out if they are trustworthy. Is this a person that is trustworthy because I know they're trying to influence me. They're trying to get me to change something about, uh, about the way that I think, the way that I act, the way that I vote. And so, uh, so when somebody's trying to influence you, and I shared this story right a, a while back about the Kirby salesman who um, almost, like, I was, you know, ready to buy the, the vacuum, and I had to ask Karen, like, I guess uh, we went outside, and when I came back inside, she was crying, and, and so then I'm like, oh, no, what have I done? And I had to go back out and tell him, never mind. But, but he was a salesman, and he was trying to persuade me, but his motivation was very selfish. And he was just trying to get sales for himself and, and you know, pad his wallet. And so he wasn't really looking out for me, even though that's what they do. They come in, this will be the most amazing thing for you to clean your carpet so well. And in politicians, I think in some ways they're no different. They're trying to convince you that what they're, uh, what they're doing is going to be in your best interest. And I, I don't want to be cynical, because I definitely feel on it anyway. I, I, man, I feel like most of politics is very deceptive. I don't think every politician is deceitful. But I think that's how the game is played. And, and so it's challenging to me. Uh, but here people want to be influential and persuasive. And so I'm trying to understand where are they coming from. And, and I think one of the ways that I decide, okay, I might trust this person, is if, if they have integrity, if they practice what they preach, if they've lived up to their message. And, and why am I talking about that? Because here we are, find ourselves again in 2 Corinthians, and we're in 2 Corinthians 6 tonight. And, and really, uh, uh, what Ethan talked about last week and what we're continuing to build upon is this idea of being influential for Jesus. And last week we saw in chapter 5 that Paul said, we are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. He says, we implore you, be reconciled to God. That God made him who had no sin to be sin or to be a sin offering on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so Paul is saying, I'm imploring you, I'm begging you, I'm trying to influence you. And so if we're trying to have a ministry, which I hope that we do, you know, I was, uh, as, I, as I prepared today, I was like, why would, why would you guys care about what I'm about to talk about? Why would this make any difference in your life? And I would say, if you are not interested in being influential for Christ, then this probably won't be that interesting to you. And I don't know, uh, first of all, I don't know that everyone in here is even a committed follower of Christ. But beyond that, I know some people are pretty... <coughs> lackluster in their enthusiasm for Christ. And so uh, I hope that you desire to be influential for Jesus, that you desire to be a co-laborer as Paul described himself and, and that baton has been, added, has been passed down to us. Because one of the things that we saw last week, or uh, maybe it was two weeks ago, yeah, it ties in, it's verse 10, then on down. 
that Paul said, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Like there's going to be a final exam. And I guess you can live your life as if there won't be. But the scripture says that there will. And I think it's foolish, especially if you say that you believe this is the word of God, how can you not take that seriously? And, and, and one of the things that Ethan showed us last week, right, is that uh, we know what it is to fear the Lord, but we're not motivated by fear. And that the writer of Hebrews says it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That, that if you've experienced forgiveness for your sins, then you understand how gracious and merciful and kind and compassionate God is. And that is a free gift that is offered to anyone who would repent of their sins and receive Christ and follow Christ. But for whoever does not do that, whoever doesn't receive God's free pardon, they will answer for their sins. And that is a dreadful thing. And so I think that's part of what Paul is saying. He's saying, man, we know what it is to fear the Lord, therefore we try to persuade men that even though we're not in that situation anymore, we should still care about people who are. But Paul says, and he says, I'm not going to go out here. It's the love of Christ that motivates me. And so I'm compelled by Christ's love because he died. He died for us, and he died for us that we would no longer live for ourselves, but we would live for him. And so, so God's call for us as followers of Christ is to be influential for Christ. And so if we want to do that, then I think we should follow Paul's advice here as we continue on in chapter 6. So I hope that this is what you want to do. I hope you want to be influential for Jesus and you uh, want to join in with Paul when he says here. So let's pick up in verse 3. Paul writes, he says, We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and honor, bad report and good report, genuine, yet regarded as imposters, known, yet regarded as unknown, Dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful and yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened our wider hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as to my children. Open wide your hearts also. All right, and so there's some things here, again, as we've been going through 2 Corinthians this semester, I hope that you're becoming more familiar with this letter that Paul wrote and the context. And clearly, right, we continue to see Paul talking about his sufferings and the things that he's gone through as an apostle. We continue to hear how there's this strained relationship that Paul cares deeply about them. And here he's even saying that I'm pouring my hearts out to you and you guys are like, you know, talk to the hand. You're stonewalling me. Guys, I, I'm, you're like my children. I love you so much. Return that love. And so here we're going to see in some of the ways that Paul says that he is uh, strived. It's not striven. He is strived to be influential for Christ. Okay, so first of all, three things that I want to give you tonight is first of all that we don't, don't put up legitimate stumbling blocks. Now, uh, now, clearly, and I'll come back to this later, but it's clear, it's interesting, right? Paul says, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path. And yet, there were lots of people who were offended by Paul, who thought, um, you know, Paul tripped them up. And if you think about a stumbling block, I mean, there's that little picture, right? It's like something that causes somebody to trip. Something that, um, you know, if, if there were, uh, I don't know, if you were trying to walk up to the BSU in the dark up that hill, you know, and the dirt is uneven, and there's pieces of wood everywhere, and there's a string. It's not tight, tightly enough to actually clothesline anybody, but it'll probably shock you and frighten you. You're like, oh, you know, there's all these things that will cause you to fall, okay? Like, that's not a complicated thing, right? Stumbling blocks, we kind of get that. And so, uh, some of your translations say, we give no cause for offense. 
And it's interesting that Paul says that because a lot of people were offended uh, by Paul, uh, at Paul. And so, so Paul is saying there's no legitimate reason for people to be offended by what I'm doing, okay? And so here's a couple things. First of all, what, how, how do we put up stumbling blocks? What do we do? Well, first of all, living as a hypocrite, when we represent Christ poorly, that is a stumbling block. Okay, guys, again, if I'm trying to get from point A to point B and there's all this rubble in my way, it slows me down, it trips me up, I fall. When I fall, I get hurt. You know, you, you tear your pants, you skin up your knees. Uh, maybe, maybe you even decide it's not worth it. And so to cause other people to stumble in their, uh, in their pursuit of God and their relationship with God is like really a big deal. Uh, that you might actually uh, even keep someone from wanting to pursue God is, is, I don't know, that's a, I mean, you can, you know, really wrestle with that theologically. But in Romans 2.24, in Romans 2.24, Paul is writing at the beginning of Romans, and we studied Romans last year in our life groups, and, and again, I said this every week, and I'll say it again later, but like, if you're not in a life group yet, you absolutely should, should jump into one. We're studying through Mark. Last year, we studied through Romans, and at the beginning of Romans, Paul begins to paint a picture of why uh, humanity is under the wrath of God, and first he talks about the, the people that are really bad, that we would all be like, oh, everybody... Everybody in society kind of points the fingers and say, oh, yeah, yeah, those people are under the wrath of God. Well, that's, that's good. They deserve it. They're bad people. All right? Well, then Paul turns to the kind of self-righteous moralizers. They're not necessarily, uh, they're, maybe they're the people who are spiritual, but they're not religious. And, and he's like, you know what? You do the same things that those other people do. You just hide it better. And then he turns his gaze finally to the religious people. To the Jews specifically. And he says, you know, you who preach against stealing, do you steal? Uh, and, and so what he says to them in Romans 2.24, guys, this is such a heavy verse. And in some ways, I feel like this is kind of a heavy, heavy topic tonight. This idea of uh, not being a stumbling block. And after talking about these religious hypocrites, this is what Paul says. He says, as it is written... God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Like, there are people who uh, will, will curse God because of the way that these hypocrites live. There will be people who will use religious hypocrisy to justify their unbelief. In fact, it was a few... Uh, I mean, I don't know how long ago. It was a little while ago when they had the Sex in the Station talk and Dr. Ray was supposed to come and I was all like amped up to interact with Dr. Ray and then he didn't come. But I watched a couple of his YouTube videos and he makes lights like that. He talks about how, you know, Christians are no different than anybody else. In fact, they, they get divorced more than, than uh, non-Christian non people do. And they're, they're sleeping around more than non-Christian people are. And I really wanted to talk to him about that because I don't agree with that. And, and I, you could to find the term Christian really broadly, right? But that was part of his argument. He's to say religious people are no different. So what value is that is there in that? They're just hypocrites. And guys, I mean that really causes problems for people. It's like people really are watching. There are people who uh, are paying attention. And I again, I agree. I understand that lots and lots of people call themselves Christians, but I, I I'm convinced that even amongst I mean, in the closest friend that I have is a non-believer. Even he recognized, like, yeah, his parents claimed them to be Christians, didn't go to church, were really uh, mean-spirited, harsh people, and he knew there was a difference between them and me, all right? He knew, yeah, they call themselves Christians, but I don't buy that, but there's something different about you. And I think the world sees that, okay? I think they know when you're the real deal. And yet, if we are living out what we believe, if we are practicing what we preach, we can be putting stumbling blocks up for people. I think that's a real uh, big deal. That's a problem. Uh, some other way that we put up stumbling blocks, that's really, I think, primarily the first one, living a, as a hypocrite, is really more a way that we cause non-believers to stumble. And, uh, man, I don't know. There's a verse in Acts. I think it's in Acts chapter 15 when they have the Jerusalem Council. And uh, I can't remember if Peter says this or James says this as they're, as they're discussing, but one of the things they said is, is, is we decided that we should not make it difficult for those 
who are trying to turn to God. So good self-evaluation. Is your life helping non-believers see God, or is it actually making it harder for them? Okay. I know that's like a heavy question, right? But these are, I just think this is good for us to stop and evaluate, and, and that's part of what Paul's doing, is he's just saying, and this is how I live my life, okay? So maybe some people have some issues with me, but it's not because of what I've done. It's actually just because they're, they're mean-spirited, jealous people. So first of all, living is good. Second of all, um, Allowing like gray areas to lead other people into sin. And this is a whole sermon. Right, I can spend a lot of time talking about uh, disputable matters. Romans 14 talks about this, 1 Corinthians 8 talks about this, 1 Corinthians 10 talks about this. It talks about how um, in that day there was this big debate about meat. And uh, the other day I went to the store and bought some hamburger for Karen. All right, I was got to make sure I buy the right kind, and i got to reach into the very back so I get the one that's still the coldest, because that's how she likes to do it. And, and I tell you what, uh, I have never, I've never went and got my ground beef and then looked at it and thought, I wonder if this cow was sacrificed to a false god before it got ground up and sent to wall. Right, that is never, you're like, what are you talking about? What I'm talking about is that was a problem in the New Testament. Because there were pagan temples all over, and they would sacrifice animals to their false gods, and then they would ship the meat down to the market, and they would sell it. And so Christians would go to the market, and some Christians would have a real hard time with that. And they'd be like, oh man, I don't think I should, if this was sacrificed to an idol, I shouldn't eat it. I might be participating in idolatry. And so then there were other Christians who were like, oh come on, there's only one God, that's just a statue, and this is a really good deal. Right? <laughs> so... You know, let's just go home and have hammer. <laughs> and, and, and Paul says, and that, that person is actually correct. He says, you're right. Um, th there isn't anything that's wrong with that meat. But, he says, if you're younger, you know, spiritually, not literally, but, but spiritually, your, your younger uh, brother or sister in Christ is really having a hard time with that. And he says, then, hey, don't eat that meat. He says, go ahead and do what's best for them, not what's best for you. And there are a thousand applications for that, even though we don't deal with meat sacrifice to idols. But there are so many things, you know, where uh, maybe, no, well, I'll, I'll just use Karen again. All right. So as an example, now I know that um, Karen has a, uh, uh, how do I explain this? Like, if, if she sees something that's like gruesome, or even kind of hears about it and visualize it, like that is a hard image for her to get out of her head. And, and so, um, wow, I just gave you guys so much, like, you be nice to my wife, okay? <laughs> and so, there's things that I don't bring up. There's things that I don't talk about. Because I love my wife. And I'm going to say, you know what? And, and do I think that's silly or that's weak? Like, I don't. I don't think there's, I, I don't look down on her for that, even though that's not something that's a problem for me. All right? And so maybe that gets into music you listen to or movies that you like to watch or uh, activities. I know people have strong opinions about a lot of things. But, but the point here, and I think in both of these passages, but especially in these 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and Romans passages, is um, am I going to be driven by what I want or am I going to be driven by what is best for someone else? And Paul says that, he says, yeah, you have the freedom, but don't use your freedom to cause your brother or sister to stumble. And so I would say that the law of love, I don't have that up there, the law of love trumps the law of liberty. And that Paul was consistently giving up his rights for the benefit of other people. So the first one there, living as they like, is your life helping people see Christ or is it hindering people? From seeing Christ. I think the second one really comes down to are you living for your own benefit or are you living for the benefit of other people? And I, I agree, this is just a daily struggle for me where for a little while I'm being really selfless and I'm really serving other people, and after a while, I don't know, for whatever reason, something happens, something snaps, and I'm, I'm in my car and I'm grumbling and complaining, and, and I 
have to get like an attitude readjustment from the Lord. And you get things like Philippians 2, 3 through 5, where it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. I mean, like, first of all, like, not just to say, Oh, no, Caitlin, I think you're important too. I'm important, you're important. No, that you're better. Oh. It's not very American, right? <laughs> He says, each one of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. And he, and he plays that, you know, he, then he plays the Jesus card. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And so, when I am living for what's best for someone else, then I don't cause people to stumble because I'm considering their needs. I'm being considerate of others. And there's a huge lack of that in our culture. So, uh, so here, for that, I just ask for you guys to think about, like, what drives your actions? Is it about what's best for you, or is it about what's best for other people? And I know that our culture and our flesh tells us to do, you know, look out for number one, you just, you know, do what, do what you want to do. But, I don't know. I've found that to be a very hollow experience. And living for others, serving others, I mean, there's a reason that Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And being a blessing to other people is good. And dare I even say, I mean, it's enjoyable. And maybe the right vernacular, it's fun. It's a blessing. It's, uh, it's Christ-like. So, yeah. So we open up assembly blocks. All right? We want to be influential for Christ. We're not hypocrites in how we live. Because that, uh, that can cause Christians to stumble. I think it really causes non-believers stumble. Um, we really live for the benefit of one another in the body of Christ. Alright? Another one here in this passage that I see. I kind of got three things for you guys tonight, so that was the first one. But the second one is that we speak the truth in love. Alright? And, and Paul is saying that here. He's like, guys, you know, we've spoken freely to you. We've opened our hearts to you. We love you. And um, and I appreciate what Maddie shared, and, and that's, I, I think, one reason why um, you don't have to be a disaster management major. You just have to love Jesus. Because when you love people, you serve them. Uh, love is meeting needs. And so uh, I want to come to this idea of speaking the truth in love, but, but the love part, love is meeting needs needs. Love their, the, the fact that Paul is saying at times some harsh things to this church, it only works, and I guess you could even argue that it doesn't work. Okay, It does work. There's a, it's challenging. But the only reason it works is because they know Paul cares about them. Because Paul has a relationship with them. And I know that I talked to you guys uh, I said this to several people, but I've talked about how I think that um, like, I, and this isn't just like the pink sheet relationships, which you know, I didn't make it pink on purpose. This is literally the only color of paper that we have in the building, and we have like reams of it. So, so the hundred hours of prayer sheet is pink, okay? And it's on that wall. When you want to sign up for hundred hours of prayer after real life tonight, it's over there on that new big bullet board, which may not be for very long, but it'll be for a little bit, right? And so, um, so they knew that Paul cared about them because he had built a relationship with them, and so in any relationship. Um, I think of relationships as like a bank account. And when you invest in people, when you spend time with people, when you serve people, you make a deposit. And when you correct someone, when you sin against someone, when you let someone down, you make a withdrawal. And one of the things that is just reality, I think, is that you can, uh, it takes longer to build up an account than it does to spend it. That's kind of how real money works, right? You know, you're like, man, really? I feel like I've, I've, I've put like three or four paychecks in there. That's all the money I have. But you could go to Walmart and spend it all in one day. You know? And, uh, and so sometimes we try to speak the truth to people that we don't have a relationship with and it doesn't get very far. Um, but speaking the truth in love. And I think this plays itself out a lot in our culture and our day. I think this actually plays out more in social media than it does even in our face-to-face -face relationships. I think that there are lots of people who want to speak the truth. Just want to speak the truth. You know, hey, this is what's right. I don't care if you like it or not. 
right? I got the sword of the spirit. It's like this big two-handed, you know, claymore sword, and I'm just swinging it around. You know, I don't care who I injure. If you get hurt, that's your problem. It's truth. All right, deal with it. And guys, can I tell you that you can be right and be wrong? Okay. And I know I can't address the, the whole world, and, and I tell you what, my interaction on social media is so limited, because I feel like there's just a whole lot more opportunity for making large withdrawals than there are for making very many positive uh, investments. And I'm not saying that there's no redeemable qualities, but I'm just saying I have a hard time with it. I just think, I'm going to try to make most of my investments face-to-face -face in, in interpersonal relationships. And so... If I post something on social media, it's usually just me trying to be funny. Right? And when you guys don't like my tweets, it really hurts my feet. <laughs> right? I mean, I thought I had a pretty good Indiana Jones thing, and like two of you liked it, but one of them was Ethan, right? Both of you guys, Ethan and Christian together? Man. I liked it. <laughs> Ethan and Christian. Well, there's three likes. Come on, guys. All right? That's right, yes, everybody's, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm at Yakovary Fair. Alright, you're like, what? That's my name. That's who I am. Or you probably look at Brian from my real name. That shows up. Okay. <laughs> but, you can, you, can, you can be right and be wrong, okay? And, and some people just want to blast their opinions and hurt people. And, uh, and I know for a fact, we go back to that first slide. I know there are, um, Karen and I were talking about this. We know non believing people who are really put off by Christians because just some of the blasts that they put online. They go on Facebook rants, they go on Twitter rants, wherever you want to go, and just go on these big tirades. And sometimes, guys, they're not even, they're not even, you know, like I said, you can be right and be wrong. Sometimes they're not even right, they're just opinionated. It's just people sharing their opinions. And I put Colossians 4, 5, and 6 up there because Paul says to the church at Colossae, he says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Be wise. I think, he didn't say be right. He said be wise, making the most of every opportunity. And that's a really good guideline for us, that you can be right and be wrong. But if we're trying to be wise, then I think we can be right in all aspects. Some people only want to speak the truth, but some people only want to be loving. You know, oh, I just, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I just want to love people. I just want to make people feel good. Proverbs 27.6. All right, it says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Uh, there's another proverb that says, better is open rebuke than hidden love. There are a lot of proverbs about love. Uh, but it's not loving to withhold the truth from someone. It can actually be quite dangerous, because you, you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. You want to be non-confrontational. If we're going to be influential for Christ, we need to be able to do both of these things. We need to speak the truth because, guys, if we only be loving, we're just tickling people's ears. We can, we can love people straight into hell. So we want to care about people, and as we're motivated by compassion, as we're motivated by the love of Christ, we want to speak truth. And I think that happens best uh, not in to put people on blast on social media somewhere, but in our established face-to-face -face relationships that we have. And this is what Paul's trying to do. He's saying, man, guys, I know this is difficult, but I'm doing it because I love you. So which, I, I, I think, I'd like you to think about which side do you tend to fall on? Because I think it's hard to match this. I feel like it's like a balancing beam, like to speak the truth in love. And so think for yourself. What are you more likely to do? Are you more likely to swing the sword, and I don't care who gets hurt? Or are you more likely to be like, oh, I'm never going to swing the sword. I don't want anybody. Because right? I think those are both errors. <coughs> Paul to speak the truth in love. Okay. Last thing Paul says here about being influential for Christ is that we, we can't be afraid to share God's truth. We, we have to be willing to do this. All right? And again, I come back to what I said at the beginning. That Paul was misunderstood. That Paul was maligned. He was uh, insulted. His character was dragged through the mud. So so you can do it right and still go through some really tough times. 
Uh, if there's pushback or controversy, guys, if somebody doesn't like what you have to say, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're in the wrong. Because here we see Paul dealing with this consistently. But, uh, but let's make sure that what's offensive is the message, not the messenger. But I would also say, if nobody ever pushes back against you, maybe you're playing it too safe. Right? If, if nobody ever has a problem with anything that you say, then maybe you're really not taking a stand for anything. Maybe you're not really trying to be an ambassador for Christ. And, uh, and the gospel message itself is offensive. Uh, Paul says this, I mean, in, in Romans 9.33, it says that Jesus is a stumbling stone. Like Jesus, he, he causes, uh, people are either going to uh, stand on him as the rock and build their life on Christ, or people are going to trip over him and fall. And Paul says this in 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm going to read this to you guys. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting verse 18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. I'm going to skip down a little bit. Um, in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. And so guys, the message that we believe, the message that followers of Christ are building their lives on, is... An offensive message, because what it says is it says that you are the problem. Okay, it's offensive here all, for multiple reasons. It's offensive to the Jews because we're preaching a crucified Messiah, all right, which was against everything that they believed that the Messiah would be. Uh, it's, a, it's foolishness to Gentiles because how could a king, a king who was murdered, like how could that be somebody worth following? I think there are lots of reasons today why we are maligned by the world. Because, uh, you know, well, how can you believe this? It's been changed, or it's a fairy tale, or it's been embellished. Um, pick, your, pick your poison, okay? But if you've encountered Christ, you know it's the power of God. It's the power of God unto salvation. So Paul is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And so the message is offensive. The message is divisive. I mean, the message, first of all, again, like I said, the message is that you're so bad that the only, that your sin is so offensive to God that the only way you can be forgiven is that Jesus would die in your place. The message is also incredibly offensive to our culture because the gospel says that there's only one way to be reconciled to God. There's not many ways. And that is a super offensive message. Uh, there's room for every message in our world except for that message. So it is an offensive message. But let's make sure that it's the message that's offensive and not the messenger. And Paul would say, I know people are bothered by me, but it's not because I did anything wrong. All right, so let me wrap up with this. Uh, the last thing, guys. If we're going to be um, influential for Jesus, then we first have to be influenced by Jesus. Okay, we first have to be hearing the word and obeying the word. And this is where, again, I'm going to make a life group plug. Like, you need to get into a life group. In a day into Mark's gospel, because this is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 4. Jesus said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. That, and he goes on to talk about the measure that you use, it will be measured unto you, and whoever has will be given more. And so we have a responsibility to hear and to obey and to live out God's Word. And as we do that, God gives us incredible opportunities to be influential for Christ. And so that's my last question to you. Are you seeking to know and live out God's truth? Because if you are, then you can help other people do the same thing. And be influential for Jesus. Which is way better than being a politician. <laughs> right. so, uh, so tonight, 
It's a little later than usual. We had a few extra things tonight. So tonight, I'm just going to pray for you. We're going to close in prayer tonight. And, um, and, and I want you to take a moment. All right, here's what we're going to do. Um, Carmen, you're going to load that song back up. I'm going to get like a minute. And it's going to make me feel like forever, okay? But I'm going to give you a minute of time uh, where I'm going to stop talking and you can just pray. Maybe you need to pray for you, all right? And maybe you would say, I haven't been influential for Jesus, or maybe I've been a bad influence. And, and if you want to give that to God and ask God to change that in you, this is the time to pray. If there are some people you're like, no, I'm trying to be influential for Christ. There's some very specific people that I would like to see follow Jesus, and this is a good time to pray for them. All right, maybe you're still wrestling with whether you want to follow Christ or not. Uh, you can pray about that. I would love to talk to you more about that. But, but I want to give you a little bit of time just for you to pray, and then I will close us after that. So. <laughs>